Good evening, uh, good evening, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Hanna Radziejowska and I am the head of Pilecki Institute in Berlin. Uh, before I start our meeting, I will briefly explain to our German and Polish audience uh, the possibility of listening to simultaneous interpretation. Uh, our debate will be held in English and translated into German and Polish. Uh, Szanowni Państwo, uh, bardzo prosimy, uh, żeby, uh, uruchomić, żeby uruchomić uh, tłumaczenie, należy kliknąć w taką ikonkę, um, właśnie tłumaczenie z, z taką kulą ziemską i tam wybrać uh, język polski. Um, jeżeli tego nie widać, to znaczy, że trzeba zaktualizować sobie szybko Zoom to trwa chwilę i, i zapraszamy z powrotem, wtedy będzie ta opcja. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, bitte wählen Sie das Zeichen Übersetzung, Dolmetschen, in der unteren Leiste des Bildschirms, auf der rechten Seite, dort finden Sie diese deutsche Übersetzung. Okay, so uh, on behalf of Pilecki Institute Berlin and Uh, Pilecki Institute Warsaw. I have uh, the great honor of uh, welcoming you to our discussion on the Angel of Istanbul the, about the Polish Consul General Wojciech Rychlewicz, who between 1940 and 1942 issued thousands of false certificates to refugees uh, from Poland. In this way, he saved the Jewish citizens who were fleeing from German-occupied Poland. They tried to get to South America or Palestine, and they had to have a document proving their Catholic identity. This extraordinary story, uh, the action of rescuing Jews by issuing a false identity, was described last week by Eldad Beck in Israel Hayom. For many, this is a sensational discovery, not only because it is the first time that we have learned about this unknown story, but also because uh, research into the role of Polish diplomats in rescue operations to save Jews during the Second World War uh, has been ongoing in recent years. Um, I'm, I, I, at the beginning, I would like to, I'm very pleased that uh, Dr. Jakub, Jakub Kumok, the Polish ambassador to Turkey, uh, is listening and watching us from Ankara. Uh, Jakub Kumok is a spiritus movens of discoveries in Istanbul and, and Bern. Uh, in other words, uh, new discoveries concerning Polish diplomats rescuing Jews during Second World War. Uh, so Kuba, we greet you very much, uh, very warmly from, from Berlin, London and Warsaw. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, this evening we have great guests with us. Uh, Eldad Peck, um, uh, Israel Hayom's correspondent, um, uh, author of the article about the Polish consul in Istanbul and co-discoverer of this extraordinary story. Uh, Eldad was also the author of articles in the Israeli press about Alexander Wadoś, Polish ambassador to Bern, who forged passports for European Jews. Besides, um, Eldad Beck is one of the rare Israeli journalists who reported from Arab and Muslim countries and uh, uh, about major events in the Middle East. Uh, I have the honor of introducing Hania Witi granddaughter of uh, Wojciech Rychlewicz. Uh, Anio, uh, Hania Witi is uh, entitled MBE. It means she's a member of the order of the British Empire. Um, she was born in London and brought up in the post-war Polish refugee community. Currently, she's uh, chief executive of transport charity operating across England. She was awarded this MBE in the Queen's Honours List in recognition of her contribution both locally and nationally in 2016. And um, we, have, we, we also have with us my dear colleague from Warsaw, Monika Maniewska. 
Uh, Monika is a co-author of the Wadosh List, a publication uh, published by Pilecki Institute under the um, uh, auspices uh, of the World Jewish Congress. Uh, she researched uh, the stories of Polish diplomats during the war, and she's the um, head uh, of the department, one of the departments uh, of the Digital Archive in Warsaw, in Pilecki Institute uh, in Warsaw. Uh, also one, one remark to our audience, we invite you to ask questions during the discussion. You can enter them in Polish, English, or German. Uh, please click on this uh, Q&A button and, and enter your questions there. At the beginning, I would like to ask, uh, of course, Eldad Beck, could you please tell us this story sh shortly at, and, and explain uh, these activities of the, of the Polish consul in Istanbul, Wojciech Rychlewicz during the war? What did he do? Who, who, who was he? Um, well, I think that it's important to um, uh, say at the very beginning that we are not yet aware of everything uh, that happened at the time. Um, I think that one of the, the, the reasons that we uh, decided to uh, come out with this story is that um, persons who might have uh, further information about what happened in Istanbul at that time, uh, because uh, they belong to families who were uh, rescued by the uh, consul or people who uh, have some other information um, about the um, um, Polish um, diplomatic um, uh, presence in uh, Istanbul or in Turkey uh, would come up and uh, fill the dots that uh, are still uh, open to be filled. What we know at this uh, stage is that um, there was a um, an operation. Um, um, maybe I, I, I have to uh, explain the, uh, the circumstances. Um, we are in a situation in 1939 where um, the um, Eretz Israel, the mandatory British Palestine, is under a British um, uh, administration um, because of Arab pressure of the so-called Palestinian national um, leaders, um, the British are closing the gates of uh, Eretz Israel to any refugees trying to come from Europe. Now in 1939, before the war break with Poland, uh, it was mainly Jews coming from uh, Germany, from Austria, from uh, Czechoslovakia, all these areas that were considered as the German Reich. Um, but once the war starts with uh, Poland, between once Poland is being invaded by um, uh, Germany and then divided between Germany and the uh, Soviet Union, um, there is a movement of Jews running away from the Germans because they knew exactly what was uh, going to happen. Well, they, they didn't know exactly what was uh, the German plan, but they knew that they were going to suffer under the, uh, the Germans. So they moved to other countries. Uh, some of them moved to the parts of uh, Poland that were occupied by the Soviet uh, Union. Others, probably those who had more money uh, and more means, financial means, moved to um, uh, mainly to Romania. And from there, they uh, um, tried to get to other destinations, um, mainly through Turkey. Now, we have a, um, a huge problem with Turkey at the time, because uh, after the death of uh, Ataturk in 1938, the, um, um, the person who takes the place of Ataturk um, is um, having sympathies to Nazi Germany, which means that he is, um, there was a certain um, discrimination of Jews and other minorities before, but once uh, Atatürk dies, the discrimination is becoming uh, much worse. And uh, thinking that the Germans are going to win the war, um, the uh, persecution of Jews and the conditions that are given to the Jews in Turkey is getting much worse. Actually, at a certain period, um, only 200 Jews were allowed to stay in Turkey at the same time only 200 uh, Jews. Now, um, how could one go around this restriction? 
And um, I remind you that there is the restriction of staying in Turkey. And there's also the restriction of getting to Eretz Israel, Palestine, because according to the white book published by the, uh, uh, the British uh, authorities in 1939, just before the war started, uh, only 75,000 Jews were allowed to get to Palestine uh, in the coming 10 years, meaning that uh, right in the situation where Jews were really needy of a safe heaven, uh, the British Empire closed the gates of uh, Eretz Israel. Um, however, if you were not a Jew, you could go to different places. You could go to Turkey, you could go to Eretz Israel. And in our case, what uh, we are going to talk about later, how I got to the whole story, um, certain countries in South America, mainly Brazil, were actually looking for um, non-Jewish Europeans fleeing their occupied countries. They wanted to uh, bring them to um, their own countries, like Brazil, uh, in order to, um, so to say, it, it, was, it was a racist uh, zeitgeist at the time. They, they wanted to improve the uh, population uh, in those countries with uh, people coming uh, from Europe. So if you would be um, a Catholic Polish, you could get either to uh, first of all, to, uh, uh, to Turkey, then to uh, Eretz Israel, Palestine, and to different distances also in South uh, America. So what uh, Rychlevich did was that he falsified documents stating that um, um, uh, these Jewish persons who came to him were actually Catholic or Christian from different um, uh, uh, churches, and uh, by doing that, he actually opened them the way to the safe heavens either in Eretz Israel or in uh, South America. This was uh, his main um, uh, activity. We do not know how many people were saved by these false Christian um, uh, documents. Um, I will later on read to you the uh, testimony of the main uh, figure in my uh, in my story, a, a, a Jewish lady that was uh, actually that discovered the whole thing, uh, that her testimony uh, made me discover the whole thing, um, uh, and um, um, so uh, those persons were able to, with these uh, falsified Christian uh, um, uh, documents, get uh, to save heavens and save their lives. Uh, one thing that also has to be reminded in this context is that the Jews at the time were fleeing not only the Nazis, they were also to a certain extent fleeing uh, the uh, Soviets. And can you explain who was Ruchlevich? How did this uh, action start? I mean, right. So we, we, we do not know too much about who he was. Um, we know about his uh, um, about his first years. Um, we suspect that he was apparently a member of the uh, uh, military intelligence of the uh, uh, Polish army in underground, um, and uh, that his nomination as uh, vice consul to Istanbul in 1937 had to do with uh, his. Um, uh, military activities. Uh, later on, he's being nominated as the uh, person responsible of the consulate, not the uh, um, uh, general consul. And as such, he was able to uh, produce the uh, falsified um, documents that were um, uh, that were distributed to uh, Jews that managed to get to uh, Turkey. And by the way, uh, these certificates also allowed them to get from Romania, for example, uh, to Turkey. Um, we know that in, um, I think it was March 1941, uh, for reasons that we are not sure about so far, um, he, uh, Rychlevich, uh, moves from Turkey to join the Polish army of the exile government. And he is uh, going to the Middle East. Uh, at a certain time, he was in Egypt, but he was mainly based in, um, 
in Eretz Israel in Palestine, where there were large parts of the uh, Polish uh, army stationed um, from 41 on, mainly in 42. And by the way, this um, arrival of uh, Polish uh, army units enabled many Jews uh, to come from uh, the Soviet Union uh, and to find refuge in, uh, in Eretz Israel, in Palestine, as uh, uh, Polish Jews. One of them, by the way, was um, somebody which you might know, the former Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin. So it's a fascinating story. Um, the question to uh, Hania Witi, uh, did you know this story? Uh, how did, did, is this moment when you get to know about your grandfather, uh, what he did? We had absolutely no idea. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time ringing around relatives, um, but no one knew anything. Um, and we've reason to believe that they didn't actually tell anyone either, because we think that maybe one of the older relatives would have told their children once, once they're of an older age. And how do you remember your grandfather? I mean, uh, yes, it's like um, when when you heard this story, when you when you this, this story uh, written by Eldad, what was for you most important? Uh, about this rescue action or yes well um i was eight years old when he died and he died of lung cancer uh so looking back and talking to my brothers uh we're probably unlikely to have seen much of him when he was very ill so our memories are, are sort of very poor and most memories are, as for any of us are, are based on photographs um, so we didn't, we didn't really know him as a person. Uh, my grandmother lived another 10 years and we had a very strong relationship with her and saw a lot of her, but um, very little of, of our grandfather. Um, so when, when, when this story starting, started coming out and, and actually we, we still understood very little because it didn't, I, I had snippets, but it didn't all kind of join up together. And it's only when I read Eldad's uh, article that it all really did come together and we understood uh, the, the, the nuances of it and, and the historical background. Um, and uh, my brothers, uh, my family, and, and of course myself, we're, we're just so proud, uh, you know, to be, um, uh, to be there, his, his grand grandchildren, even though we, we don't remember him. Um, it, it's an amazing legacy, and uh, and uh, Eldad, um, 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 Dr. Meh, um, made a very uh, strong comment about uh, future generations uh, understanding these role models, and um, and why I'm very keen to, to help as much as I can um, to to let the story unfold. Uh, there's the world at the, at the moment doesn't have too many uh, very good role models that, that we're all sort of living with. And, um, and I think this story has is, is come out at a very good time. I, I thought in one sense, you, you, you have been continuing this legacy. I mean, this activity of your grandfather, um, I mean, in the, as an extremely active person in this field of charity, helping people. And I, I thought in this way that has this discovery helped you to see perhaps your activity in this context too? I mean, this... Well, um, you know, it's, I've grown up with it from childhood. Uh, my, I knew my grandmother was very active. We were very aware of my grandmother's work during the war um, and, and post-war. Uh, and again, the details of that are only just coming out. And the memories and, and the understanding is really from a, from a child's perspective as opposed to an educated adult. Um, but then my grandparents, uh, my, my parents, my mother and my father, between them, ran a Saturday, were head teachers of a Saturday Polish school in London and making sure that, uh, that their children, you know, the, the children of the refugees, the first born, first generation born in, in London, could speak and write 
uh, and read Polish. Um, and so that was a sort of a, a, a lifetime of dedication to the community. Um, and I've just, I, I can't imagine not working for anybody, but uh, for an organization that does good for others. Uh, and that, I mean, uh, how did it happen that nobody knew this story until now? I mean, uh, where did this mystery come from? Why was this story forgotten? And uh, of course, the most important question, how was this story of Consul Rychlewicz discovered? I think that it has to do a lot with the, the, the personality of um, the persons involved. Um, from what I understand from um, um, uh, Mrs. Whitty's uh, stories about her grandfather, um, he um, and his wife were very uh, modest persons, uh, more interested in helping others than um, telling everybody what they have done, uh, which is also something that you uh, uh, rarely see these days. Uh, but um, if you all, you have mentioned at the beginning the um, um, the operation uh, Lados, which took place in um, in Switzerland, um, also a uh, great uh, operation to rescue uh, Jews uh, um, through the help of um, um, uh, Polish diplomats. It, you have exactly the same situation, um, meaning you're dealing with persons who were uh, more. Uh, interested in in doing the work that they were doing than in going around after the war and telling everybody, hey, um, you owe us something, or um, um, maybe it has to do with a certain uh, Polish character. I'm not, uh, um, uh, I don't feel myself uh, expert enough to, to say it, but uh, the fact that it repeats itself uh, shows uh, very um, um, interesting things. Now, um, it also, I believe, has to do with the fate of the uh, uh, government in exile, the Polish government in exile, which actually didn't exist in the uh, knowledge of many people um, uh, after, after the war. Uh, so everything that had to do with it uh, sort of uh, disappeared and people were talking about communist Poland and not about the other Poland. So they didn't have enough uh, lobby to uh, push um, uh, these stories uh, in advance. And um, um, Hania Witte uh, mentioned the name of Dr. Bob Meth, uh, who is actually the reason that we are uh, here uh, tonight. He is a, uh, a uh, Jewish um, uh, physician uh, living in Los Angeles. And um, he um, is very active in different uh, Jewish and Zionist organizations. And um, when uh, the sons of his brother uh, had recently, 2013, I believe, uh, Bar Mitzvah, the grandmother who was uh, still alive, wrote the story of her life. And um, this is uh, how we actually, um, how the family and how we know the story. Now, if you allow me, I will show, I would ask to show you the uh, parts uh, that are relevant uh, from her memories uh, to our stories. So um, if we can show the first, um, right. And I will uh, read to you what is uh, here uh, uh, being uh, written by uh, Ellen Meth, who was born as uh, Eduarda Wang in uh, a small city next to uh, Kharkov. Um, it was by a sheer accident that we ran into Mr. Danich a uh, young attorney, son of our landlord in uh, Jachov, this is where they, uh, they, they, she was born, who uh, told us uh, that the government of Brazil had 10,000 immigrant immigration visas for Catholic citizens of Poland. Mr. Daniec and his wife, both of, um, uh, both of them uh, Catholics, were uh, planning to go uh, to Brazil on those visas. Polish Jews, however, had to have uh, 10,000 US dollars at the time, it was a huge amount of money in Brazil in order to obtain the visa. Young Mr. Daniel suggested that we uh, obtain um, uh, baptismal uh, certificates just in case. I still have my uh, father um, baptismal uh, certificate stating that my grandmother's uh, name was Maria and my grandfather's uh, Joseph, which is quite an interesting choice of names, and uh, that he uh, would then 
take us to the Polish consulate uh, for further certifications uh, of our status, like uh, Sugihara, which was the Japanese um, uh, consulate in uh, Vilna in 1940, and uh, who gave saved many Jews. Um, he um, um, Japan, well, she gives here the uh, translation. We will go to the uh, the explanation. We'll go to the next uh, page, where she actually is. Yeah. Uh, the Polish Council in Istanbul issued countless affidavits to Polish Jews trapped in Turkey. He certified under oath that they were Roman Catholics, knowing that they were not. And the only criterion was that they have Polish or neutral sounding surnames. After we had obtained our affidavits, we in turn, like Mr. Danitz in our case, uh, brought acquaintances to the Polish Council and certified them uh, that they were Christians and thus enabled them to get entry visas to Brazil, which means it was quite a large operation. And the last picture I want to show you is actually the Christian certification, uh, which was given by uh, Rechlevich to uh, this family. I, I, I will not go into the details of the story of the family, but Bob, the son of, uh, of Eduarda uh, uh, Wang, uh, at a certain point he's trying to um, find out who was the consul, what was his name, because the mother did know the name, as you see in her uh, memoirs. And then he contacts a, um, uh, a Polish diplomat who was going to uh, uh, serve in Istanbul, um, who promised to try to find out, and he didn't. And um, then uh, Bob Math actually uh, goes to another Polish diplomat, this time in Los Angeles, and this one, um, made the connection between him and the uh, Polish uh, ambassador in the new Polish ambassador in Ankara, uh, our friend uh, Jakob uh, Kumoch. Um, and uh, since Jakob uh, already uh, had experience with discovering uh, these sort of uh, operations, he, uh, with his assistance, found uh, the material that we needed about the many, many Jews who received uh, such um, uh, certificates, such fortified uh, certificates, and were able to move from uh, uh, Turkey uh, to other destinations. Was this operation dangerous? I mean... Was... Well, listen, a, a diplomat that is falsifying documents is taking upon himself a huge, um, a, a huge uh, risk, because once it's being discovered, um, he, he can be brought uh, to trial uh, by the, uh, the, the authorities of the country where he serves because he's not supposed to do such criminal activities. We have to say it, it was a criminal activity. Now, we uh, have to, what we are not sure yet is to what extent, to what extent others were uh, involved in these things. Did he have uh, the permission of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the ambassador in Ankara? Did he have the permission of the uh, um, exile uh, government in, uh, in London to do these things? Uh, in the case of uh, the Operation Ladosh, we do have such uh, proofs. We don't have it uh, right here. So we do not know if he did it by um, you know, his own initiative or uh, that there were others, uh, other persons involved, but he was definitely, definitely uh, taking a risk. So perhaps it's too early and we will wait until the new discoveries. And I would like to get uh, into these activities of Polish diplomacy during the war. L uh, let me just, uh, okay. if I can so, add just, yes. just one thing mm -hmm. which is extremely, uh, extremely important. At a certain point, the military, the Polish military attaché in Ankara is, and these are the documents that we have, is getting angry that Jews get help instead of Polish soldiers that were actually using the same way of moving from uh, Europe, from uh, Romania, Yugoslavia, uh, mainly uh, through uh, Turkey to uh, Eretz Israel, Palestine and other destinations. In them. He's actually getting angry that the Jews are taking, are being given the place of Polish uh, soldiers. And by stating that, he is actually confirming the Jews were helped by the, uh, the Polish uh, consulate in Istanbul. This is extremely important. Uh, so 
perhaps it's, it's very interesting, I perhaps coming back to this problem of uh, involving Polish diplomacy and Polish government, um, you, uh, that you, you mentioned the case of Wadosh, uh, this Polish ambassador to Bern, who forged uh, Latin American passports uh, with Jewish organization. And Monika Maniewska, uh, many people say that everything was already known, I mean, in this scholar word. Uh, what is new in this scientific sense, but also in this international sense, um, as regards the activities of the, of the Polish embassy in Bern and the Polish consulate in Istanbul? Uh, if these stories are new, why why do we find out about them only now, so many years after the war? It seems to me about Rychlevich that this discovery is new and it's huge <laughs> and it has not been analyzed so far. As for Wadosh, the answer is really simple. Uh, the scheme passports was known, uh, but it was always linked with the Jewish organization, not the Polish diplomats. Uh, before uh, we could ac access the Swiss archives, we didn't know that the most, par the most of the Paraguayan passports were issued by the Polish legation. Uh, once we could compare the handwriting of the passports and the other documents signed by Konstanty Rokitsky, uh, we became aware that he was the one who was issuing all the most of the passports. Uh, what was really new about uh, the passport scheme uh, is the fact that the, the passports were issued not only for Polish Jews, uh, but to Dutch, German, uh, Czech Jews. Uh, and thanks to uh, research on the Wadosh group, uh, we can now estimate the actual number of people for whom the passports were issued. Uh, so with this discovery, we learned uh, the personal uh, involvement of Polish diplomats and the exact uh, scope of the whole operation. As for Rynievich, Rychlevich, I'm sorry, <laughs> Rynievich is one of the others group. Uh, Rychlevich, uh, it's, uh, for me, it's another proof that Polish diplomats were not uh, passive, you know? Uh, they acted uh, in their own way. And I think this, uh, um, this research uh, is worth uh, expanding, yeah? I think we should look uh, not only for individual cases, like in this case, Turkey and, uh, and Switzerland, but also examine it uh, in a broader perspective. Now we have access to archives all over the world, yeah? And uh, now the subject is renewed. I mean, the interest in the subject of Polish diplomats who were rescuing Jews is renewed. Uh, so I think now we can fully explore uh, that, uh, vital subject, yeah. Uh, Eldat, uh, perhaps it's uh, in this context also of uh, Polish-Jewish-Israeli relationship, can be this uh, role of Polish diplomats and this discovering these stories, something like um, game changer, I mean, this new discovery that it can something change and bring to, uh, I mean, better relationship or better um, seeing from Jewish Israel perspective, the, the, the Polish activity during the war. Yes, well, I believe that this is a very important uh, element of uh, um, trying to uh, improve again um, or to um, dismiss the tension, the existing tension between uh, Israel and uh, Poland. Uh, because um, it shows that we are not talking about a, a black and white uh, situation where all the Poles are uh, being uh, considered by many Israelis and anti-Semites, uh, mainly because they do not have enough uh, information. By the way, I think that this is um, a work that has to do by the, the Polish authority um, authorities, um, just bringing more awareness of um, uh, what uh, Poles, first of all, the, the Polish history during the Second World War and what uh, Poles have done um, uh, in order to uh, help uh, Jews during the uh, Second World War uh, now and the Holocaust. Um, without um, any doubt, we, have, um, we are dealing with uh, opposition uh, because it's very uh, easy to uh, uh, claim that uh, all the Poles were, uh, or most of the Poles were uh, 
uh, either cooperating with the Nazis or even being uh, worse than the Nazis. Um, unfortunately, we, we, we deal with people who, who spread those uh, opinions um, that are based uh, on mainly ignorance. Um, stories like uh, the, the one uh, regarding the uh, Ladosh operation and the Rechlevich operation are definitely um, uh, helping to uh, inform the Israeli and also the Jewish public about what really happened during uh, the Second World War uh, in Poland. And once again, that there is no, um, th th there are a lot of uh, uh, colors that can be brought into, uh, into these stories. I can tell you that when I was writing about the Ladosh um, uh, operation, the reactions from certain, um, let's say, uh, anti-Polish um, elements in the Israeli population were much more um, radical uh, than uh, the reactions that I'm getting so far. Um, with the Rechlevich story, um, I have the impression that people are interested, they're not attacking, they are just interested in, in, in reading the story. And this is a uh, very interesting development. So you mean these radical reactions were negative, I mean, at the beginning? Yeah, well, I, I'm not being attacked this time as I, I'm, I'm more or less, which is completely stupid, uh, but I'm more or less considered uh, to be an agent of the Polish uh, uh, government, uh, just because I'm uh, uh, bringing up uh, facts that are disturbing uh, the, um, uh, the narratives of those who want to uh, um, uh, keep Poland uh, in the negative uh, um, uh, zone. Um, uh, th this time, so far, let's maybe it will come. So far, I uh, I was not uh, attacked. I think uh, when I think about Rychlewicz and about Wadosh, I see it in perhaps in this um, uh, that there is after. Mm, Hanar and this uh, notion political community and perhaps the time of difficult uh, Polish-Jewish relations in this field of uh, history uh, this often often boils down to the statistical calculation of good and bad people how many Poles helped how many saved how many betrayed and perhaps did the discussion about this role of the Polish state this political community that stood uh, from beginning to the end against the Third Reich, and when we're talking about Wadosh or Rechlewicz, it's a Polish state. I mean, Polish state tr tried to do everything to save Jews and to make the world war of the Holocaust. I mean, it's not, it's something, it's a different perspective. I mean, and perhaps it's the question also to Monika, can we, when we research these stories, can we tell this story in this way? Can we find the documents that they prove such a, um, I don't know, idea of, of how we can see this? Uh, yes, uh, in Wadosh, of course, uh, we have many documents uh, saying that Polish government was really involved, approved the whole action and uh, and all we have to remember that Poland was under occupation, and we had a government in exile in London. And still, Poland made efforts to save uh, citizens, uh, Polish and not not even Polish, through diplomatic posts. Yeah, which re which still remains. So we have examples from Switzerland, Switzerland like Wadoś and Turkey, Rychlewicz, uh, where such posts uh, continued to help uh, people. But let's recall other names very known, Witold Pilecki or Jan Karski, who informed the world about the Holocaust. And for example, the UNWCC, so the United Nations War Crimes Commission, uh, which prepared documents, materials for post-war trials. And uh, in those documents, the majority of cases concerned the Holocaust. And Poland was the second after France which the with the largest numbers of cases. Mm, I will share with you one document, uh, one document uh, if I can. Uh, it's a letter uh, from Stanisław Mikołajczyk, uh, who is saying very important words. Uh, Prime Minister. 
Uh, then he wasn't the prime minister. Oh, sorry. Uh, days he was the minister of the interior, but from July 1943, he became the prime minister <laughs> of the uh, government in uh, exile. I will just share it. I'm sorry. <laughs> just working on that. Um, here. Uh, do you see it? I hope you see it. It's in Polish, uh, but uh, I will uh, I will read the translation. So, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in London, having consulted the Committee for the Country's Home Affairs, I am of the opinion opinion that the British government should should be informed that the Polish government supports all operations aimed at protecting Polish citizens, regardless of their nationality and religion and designed to save humans from violence, murder, and robbery. Uh, that's one thing. And uh, as, for, um, the as for the operation burn, uh, here uh, operation was fully approved and supported by the Polish government in exile. Uh, even the cost of uh, issuing the passports was included in the uh, budget of uh, Polish legation. And also, Polish government uh, in exile intervened um, at the Latin American governments and other governments to support them when passports had to be confirmed as real. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, it's the answer. But uh, so, so once more, if I can come back to Eldat, Eldat, is this uh, perspective? Uh, I don't know this 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 way of seeing. I mean, not in uh, looking at the individual stories, but in this uh, political meaning as a political community, Polish state. Uh, is it something that uh, exists in this uh, public discussion in Israel, or it is something that still um, perhaps, uh, or perhaps, what do you think about this? I mean, because it's it's my opinion, and that that we can call this problem that perhaps there there is a state that supports, and of course, people who are different, like everywhere. I think that uh, much more time. Once again, um, I think it's a Polish task. Um, much more time and effort uh, must be put in um, discovering. Um, this uh, unknown element of uh, activity of the uh, Polish government in exile. Uh, because what we are doing right now is that we are starting to collect the, piece, the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, but like in the case of uh, um, Rychlewicz, we already, uh, in the last days, we have received um, um, uh, or documents were received that um, show uh, definitely that um, on the um, uh, Romanian side, the Polish um, embassy was also involved in this um, um, uh, operation, which means that it was not only a local initiative, it was something much bigger. And if you have more and more embassies, now look, we have we know that the, 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 the um, uh, government in London, in Paris and then in London, uh, was uh, informed about this uh, situation and about this operation and was involved at least on, uh, on the operation in Switzerland. The um, diplomatic, uh, um, the Polish uh, diplomatic uh, representation in, in, um, in uh, Bern was involved. Uh, the one in New York was involved. The one in um, Washington was involved. The one in Istanbul was involved. The one in Jerusalem, the one in Tel Aviv, the one in Ankara, and the one in, uh, in Bucharest. Uh, this is not something that you can say has happened um, uh, just like that. Uh, you start definitely to see that there was a bigger effort a coordinated effort. And uh, I, uh, we, we must remember that uh, th th there were three and a half million uh, Jews living in Poland, okay? And uh, not few of them were extremely active in many uh, fields, the political fields, the, the, the field, the cultural field, the industrial field, etc. So they, they had contacts. They were part of the Polish society as much as certain, um, Polish elements didn't like that. Um, but uh, you see that um, the whole, there is a structural effort to save Jews 
of too many elements of the Polish government in exile, not to be a coordinated one. And this is something that has to be um, uh, really uh, researched in a very, very serious way. We have to go into the archives of all the uh, legations of, um, of Poland uh, in, in, in Europe, in, in South America. I, I, I'm looking for the, uh, the, the documents that have to do with the legations in, in, in Eretz Israel, the, the mandatory Palestine, etc. Where are all these documents and what do these documents tell us? about the bigger picture of what was happening. As long as we do not know that, and I think that this is a work that has to, do, uh, to be done by the Poles, as long as we do not know that, uh, it's a little bit difficult uh, to uh, answer definitely uh, your question. I think it's also very interesting to see in German archives, I mean, for example, in Auswärtiges uh, Amt uh, to see if the German what was the German reaction, for example, in Swiss sure. or, yes, it, it must be something somewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's a great task. And uh, the question to Hania Witt, we are talking about this discovering stories and trying to see how, how can it change? How can this new perspective change? Uh, how people, Poles are um, seen, I mean, in, 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 uh, in a word. So I would like to ask for British perspective. I mean, what can be what this this discovery of the role of Polish state in saving in saving Jews? I mean, in, from your perspective, but in this wider perspective than your family story. So is there any general knowledge in Great Britain about these Polish diplomats and this Polish state and you know, you have now your own discovered history and this this perspective being um, in London uh, whole life and... Well, Britain is an island. Um, and um, if you want to know what their perspective is towards Europe and the world, just look at Brexit. Um, and, uh, and I'll try not to say any more about that. Um, it, it's history, certainly when I was educated, um, history was, uh, was done very badly. Um, most of the history that I was taught in school was about Great Britain, um, some of the politics, but certainly not about Europe. So in the 60s, there was no mention of the two world wars, no mention of the Holocaust. Now, obviously that's changed um, and our children are more aware, but I think it's, some of it is sort of Polish patriotism. I mean, Polish, are known, Polish people are known for their patriotism and anybody who was to learn anything about Poland or about our history would be from a family that they're friends with or, or, or knew. Um, but in general, I, I really, sadly, I don't think people are interested. Uh, but it was an important part of our growing up. So if I, I refer to the Polish Saturday School, and, and it was my father's initiative, uh, and one of the lessons was to understand the Polish paths of the sort of refugee um, migration um, and sort of the, the, when people ended up in, uh, in the UK, what, what were the paths, how, what led them there? Um, but it was nothing that would be talked about in, in, from a British aspect. And, uh, and then let's not forget the, the betrayal. It's a strong word, but a lot of people will agree with it. The betrayal of Britain, of Polish people and, and of Poland. And uh, just asking around and getting prepared for this, uh, a, a friend mentioned and, and sort of non-Polish friend, that there would have been a sense of shame at the time for people who perhaps understood the situation. And when you're ashamed, you don't talk about it. So with a, with a generation uh, of, of my grandparents, my parents as well, um, the traumas, the post-traumatic stress that is talked a lot about now, but at the time was just ignored, 
um, their way of moving on in their new lives as they found themselves was to not talk about the past. So we, my generation too late uh, because they're gone now, we've got no one to ask. Um, and yes, we, we understand quite a bit and there's snippets that I will remember for the rest of my life for what my father, more my father than my mother told me. Um, but we, we never asked questions, it was just not talked about. So perhaps this uh, discovering now these stories is somehow like working out the trauma of... Yeah. Polish people. I see some questions and I will read them. Uh, first question is from uh, Jeffrey Simpler. Why was it uh, necessary for these Jews to have their religions listed as Catholic, but it was not necessary for the Wadosh passports? Um, I think it's the question for Eldad and for Monika. Somehow we you, you, you answered, but if you want to. Yeah, well, we had a uh, um... Um, uh, a very specific uh, situation here that um, there were quarters of Jews that were allowed into Turkey and into uh, Eretz Israel, Palestine. And in order to go around it, uh, they uh, needed not to be uh, Jewish. Um, I think uh, Hanya mentioned the uh, betrayal of the British uh, Empire of uh, Poland. I think that uh, we must speak about the betrayal of the British Empire uh, towards the Jews. Uh, Britain at the time was uh, uh, occupying uh, at least, um, I think, half of the world. They had enough capacities uh, to find places for the Jews trying to uh, flee for their lives from uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, and uh, what they did was to uh, give in to the uh, pressure of, um, of anti-Semites, either in the British uh, government or uh, in, in, in the Arab world, and uh, to uh, stop uh, allowing uh, Jews to get into these countries. We have to say that, and by, by declaring that there were uh, non Jew, that they were Christians, uh, it was um, possible to go around it. Now, as far as I uh, know, uh, in the uh, false passports that were given by uh, South uh, American countries, uh, in the case of um, um, uh, in the case of uh, um, uh, Switzerland, and by the way, we also had the same situation in Turkey. Um, it has to be. Um, something has to be uh, said about the difference between the two cases. The falsified passports were not to be used. They were just to allow people not to be sent to the death camps. Um, and they were not a guarantee for immigration. They, because they were falsified, you couldn't have used them. And um, 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 Alan Meth explains it very uh, specifically in her memoirs. Um, however, the falsified um, Christian documents enabled you to get a permission to go to other countries. This is the huge difference between uh, both situations. Um... Monica, would you like to add something? To yeah, uh, I, will, I would like to confirm that passports were not to use to go to, for example, Paraguay, to Latin America, American countries, but they, they, they were like a lifeline uh, to not go to death camp, but to be instead, uh, to, to go instead to internment camp and there uh, people with passports with false uh, citizenship uh, could be exchanged for uh, Germans uh, who were captured by Allied forces. So, but I, I remember that some people used the passports of Paraguay after war, um, yes, although they uh, were forged. <laughs> that's true, but they never uh, gone to Paraguay. Uh, they used it uh, to um, when they didn't still have their citizenship, like ho ho like in Holland. 
uh, they were still like stateless Jews, uh, they could use this passport to travel abroad, for example, to uh, to work as a businessman and to work abroad. So that, that's, I know two cases of passports uh, which were used this way. One is Uri Strauss and the other is uh, Heidi, uh, Heidi Fischmann's family. So Heinz Lichtenstern. And on those passports, there are uh, many uh, stamps from different countries, yeah, but not, not from Paraguay and other Latin American countries. Another question to Elder Beck, uh, Alexander Klimiuk. You have said um, that we don't know the exact number of the rescue Jews. In your article, you write about several hundreds of them. Is it possible to estimate this number approximately? Well, we have uh, lists of persons from uh, the um, um, consulates, the Polish consulates in uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv going back to Istanbul. Um, now, these lists um, uh, do not say who is a Jew and who is not a Jew, but uh, it's lists of people that managed to get to uh, Eretz Israel um, from Turkey um, through uh, different uh, channels. Maybe I should add in um, uh, response to this question that there were several um, channels of uh, moving from Turkey to um, Eretz Israel. Most of them were uh, through Syria and, um, and Lebanon. And once um, France, who was the mandatory um, power in Syria and Lebanon, was occupied by Nazi Germany, these two ways were closed. And uh, the only way that uh, was left was uh, with ships leaving different um, um, Turkish ports and going down to uh, Haifa in uh, Eretz Israel. Um, so uh, this is um, this is important also to say it's not only the Brits who um, uh, betrayed the Jews, the French uh, did so too. And there is a second part of this question from uh, Alexander Klimiuk. Where can I find full text of the testimony of Ellen Meff? Uh, has it been published anywhere? I don't, I, well, she published a, uh, she, um, she, she wrote a small book for her family. So it was not um, uh, published for the public. Um, uh, th the best way would be to get in touch with uh, Bob Math and ask him to send the, um, the copies of the book uh, to, um, to the person who is interested. So I think we can help to, manage this uh, contact. Uh, I can promise uh, Alexander Klimuk to do this. And uh, the next question, uh, Consul Markus Blechner. Uh, did Consul, uh, Consul Rychlewicz have regular contact with the legation in Bern and or Silberschein and or Haim Eyes in Zurich? As I know, there was a delegate of Aguda Israel in Istanbul by the name of Riffel or Riffel, who helped ICE to procure Paraguayan passport from legation in Bern. Was Riflevich aware of the passport scam and uh, vice versa? Did the legation know what Consul, Consul Riflevich did? Was the Polish government aware of the, these activities like they were about the Wadosh group in Bern? Well, first of all, um, uh, happy Hanukkah uh, to uh, Council uh, Blechner, uh, who was a uh, very uh, important, uh, uh, who had a very important uh, contribution uh, to the discovery of the whole uh, Ladosh operation. And I really hope that his uh, efforts uh, to obtain recognition of uh, the late ambassador Ladosh as uh, uh, just among the nations uh, from Yad Vashem uh, will uh, finally be concluded uh, successfully. Uh, I think that we owe that uh, to history. Um, we, uh, as I said before, there are still too many things that we don't know. As far as I was informed by uh, Ambassador Kumoch, um, among the um, documents that we have received, the new documents that we have received ever since the publication, there are uh, documents that uh, suggest that there was contact between the um, Polish legation in Bern and uh, the Polish consulate in uh, Istanbul. Uh, I am not sure 
that I saw any mention of the uh, of the Jewish uh, organizations that were involved in the Bern group. But once again, um, we are at the beginning of the discovery. I hope that even what we are doing today, this uh, talk would enable us to bring people to, um, to assist us in discovering the real story behind it. Uh, Jakub Kumoch said, uh, I see his, uh, he, he entered, uh, the, the, <clears throat> he can answer this question, but before uh, perhaps he will answer, uh, uh, the question uh, from uh, Wojciech Kozłowski, director of Pilecki Institute to Miss Witty, a question touching upon family memory. How is it to learn that a member of your family has done so great, great things during the Second World War? Was it a surprise, an unknown yet uh, foreseeable fact, something else? Well, it, my, my immediate reaction uh, when I read uh, Ambassador Kumoch's uh, email, uh, it's sort of written in black and white, um, you know, I read on my phone, uh, was, was just a very emotional reaction, um, you know, the, the, the sort of, you, you don't know what to think um, and it's just such a big deal and you know, I get, it's very difficult to put a word on it but you know, I think it's proud, pride um, and uh, certainly since reading the full story and seeing how it all fits together it is huge pride I mean that that's all I can say that this is my grandfather I knew him um, it's my mother's father um, we were always sort of very proud of his uh, background uh, coming from in fact, two very good Polish families um, and po Polish people are quite uh, sort of, they, they like the Schlachta and they, and they like to, to talk, talk about it. Maybe that's just uh, Polish people here, but um, we were always very sort of proud of that. But actually, it's all about the person, isn't it? And what he did. And he didn't have to do it, I suspect. It was his choice. It wasn't without risk, uh, which makes it that much more special. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just a huge pride on a, a, sort of a story of somebody that I am closely related to and hopefully have some of his genes as well. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, Marek, can you try to connect Jakub Kumoch? Uh, uh, because he, it's a great pleasure if he can answer uh, this question, uh, I think, Markus Blechner question. And I think it would also be important if um, Hanya Witty uh, would explain to everybody why actually she is in London. And not ah, yes. in Warsaw. <laughs> it, a good idea. I mean, I think it was. I think it was told, but perhaps uh, Hania, uh, can you add? Uh, can Can you try to answer this question? Why I was born in London and and not in Warsaw? Uh, yes. So uh, my grandparents joined the Drugi Korpus. And, uh, and whilst they got distracted with the, the Red Cross uh, and their work with orphans, um, the British eventually relented um, and allowed Polish refugees to settle in London. And, uh, and my grandparents, my father separately, he was in the Powstanie Warszawskie, um, ended up in, in London. And, uh, and I, I am, it is quite a strange sort of upbringing because um, I used to be very proud to be British. I'm not quite so sure these days, but um, I was very proud of British and I was very proud of my Polish background. And there was a, a mini, I mean, the, the growing up in, in post-war, it was a mini Poland like you get in, in districts in New York and, and Chicago on, on a big scale. It was Polskie Hacerstwo, uh, Polskie Tańce, Polska um, Szkoła. It, it was uh, not. It didn't suit everybody, and you grow up with a chip on your shoulder because it's so enclosed as a community. I wasn't allowed to have friends that weren't Polish, um, but um, yeah, it, it was a it was an upbringing, and, and I'm sure I am better for it. Thank you. 
and uh, welcome to uh, Jakub Kumoch. Uh, uh, yes, so the floor is yours. Well, hello everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to see all of you, particularly Hanya and Eldad. Well, Eldad is a brilliant journalist and Eldad knows how to say he doesn't know when he really doesn't know. Um, uh, there are many journalists who, despite not knowing, try to pretend they do know. Uh, this is a great feature, and uh, he was right to, to answer the Consul Blechner's question uh, whether there is a link between Bern and the Ankara. Of course, a part of uh, uh, the same ambassador being when the two things uh, have been discovered. This is uh, just, of course, a coincidence. Um, yes, there was a link between Bern and Ankara. First of all, let me tell you that um, the two operations uh, were actually took place in two different moments. Uh, the first one, the one by Rychlevich, actually happened before the main phase of Holocaust. So Jews were persecuted. They knew they were in danger, but they could not know what is going to happen, what was going to happen within next, well, two years. Now, uh, the main phase of Ale operation by Alexander Wados was conducted during the Holocaust, in the middle of Holocaust, 1943, 1942, where it was already clear that the German authorities were to murder every Jew who found himself or herself under their rule. Now, both operations started probably more or less in the same period. Uh, 1940 was a year when Poland was still divided between the Soviet Union and the Nazi Germany. Uh, at that time, uh, what was very important, particularly, it is, it's a paradox, but Eldad mentioned this also, was to rescue the most important Jewish figures from the Soviet occupation zones. So first Wadosh passports were not sent to the ghettos, they were sent to the Soviet zone. We have found such passports sent to Lvov in May 1941. Uh, that's how Poland tried to evacuate most important, most important representatives of the of its Jewish community. Uh, Rychlevich did the same. Many people who have finally landed in Turkey before that uh, spent certain time under the Soviet rule. This was the case of Edvarda Vang too. Uh, so the first, um, uh, the most important thing was to have them evacuated under a, under a pretense of either having a passport of a third country or having uh, already a, 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 a transit visa and so on and so on. So these two operations were, 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 were conducted um, parallelly. Uh, there is a document we cannot explain, but we need to carefully study, which is Consul Riklevich's letter to British legation in Moscow, informing, uh, asking them for help to provide Panamayan passports, passports of the Republic of Panama to a Jewish family. I have never ever heard about Pan passports of Panama. This is the first trace ever. There's nothing in the internet, nothing to be found. So probably the operation with use of foreign passports was also conducted in Turkey, but to a lesser, uh, to a lesser, to a lesser scale. Secondly, what brings this operation together, and here I may only speculate, uh, Consul Riklevich has the same, um, well, let's say the same CV, or CV if, may, if we may say so, as Konstantin Rokitsky, the forger from Bern. They both serve as consuls, but between their, their posts, nothing is known about their life, which makes many people believe that both were officers of the military, military intelligence. Uh, they both behave like uh, officers of, of military intelligence, which was really at a very, I mean, very good, very, 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 uh, an organization of a, of a big quality. Um, uh, so uh, when Eldad says that we need to put the uh, evidence together, there is one difficulty that we don't really have access today to any major 
major archive of Dvujka, or how, how the military intelligence was at that time was, was, was called. Secondly, we have exchanges of letters between Rychlevich and Bern. Uh, recently, uh, at least six cables between him and Abraham Zilberschein uh, were found. I saw them. Well, Zil it's Zilberschein in the middle of 1940 tells Zilberschein, Abraham Zilberschein, head of Jewish Rescue Relico Committee, Zionist Socialist, uh, who was based in Geneva during the, 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 the whole war, war uh, who was probably Wado's most important partner, he and Haim Eis in Zurich. But without Zilberschein, the Wado's operation would not have taken place, would not have been successful. Um, uh, the same uh, uh, Zilberschein writes in one moment to Konsul Ruklevich in the in summer on summer 1940, and writes about 270 Jewish refugees. 270. The limit was 200. 270 Jewish refugees in Istanbul who has who have nowhere to go. And there is an ex a, a, an expression, if I remember it well, it's in Polish. Please liquidate their stay which of course now we understand that it meant uh, do something in uh, at undertake an administrative step to so that these people administratively cease to exist and he did but by by creating many fake um, catholics there is also a letter from konstantin rokitsky to rechlevich uh, uh, in one particular case of a, of a woman who um, claimed to, well who, for for whom um, Rokitsky testifies that the person is not Jewish. So there were contacts, definitely there were contacts. Of course, institutionally, we don't know how much, uh, how much the, the two um, uh, embassies or consulates were involved, but definitely under the umbrella of the Polish governments, the, 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 the two uh, representations did have uh, contacts, despite uh, Ambassador Wadoš and Ambassador Sokolnitsky in Turkey not being, let's say, mildly uh, big friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's extremely interesting. Um, before we finish, I, I would like to read uh, not a question, but a remark. For, uh, Witold, uh, Witold Wojciech has written. Uh, I, uh, I want to add to what Eldad said, Christians going to Palestine were considered as refugees. Jews going to Palestine were considered as immigrants and had to have certificates. So I don't know if someone would like to add something, but I see nodding heads. <laughs> so uh, I think we, um, our time is slowly running out and uh, I think uh, that perhaps after this discussion, we see how much how much we have to do. I mean, as researchers, historians, and three uh, amazing uh, adventure, in fact, to 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 uh, to find out the stories and to research uh, not only this uh, uh, history of uh, Reklevich, but also um, to. Uh, to dig out uh, the story behind Wadoś and perhaps in many different um, uh, places where Polish amb ambassad amb uh, Polish consulates uh, uh, worked during the war. Um, so I, first of all, I, I would like to thank our guests and for the online visit from Ankara. So we, it was a very nice connection, London, Warsaw, Berlin, and Ankara. And uh, in the end, I would like to recommend to our German audience uh, the new issue of uh, Perspectives on 20 Centuries, our uh, online publication, uh, Pilecki Institute Berlin. And today on our website, you can find Eldad Beck's text translated into German. Uh, uh, on Wojciech Rychlewicz uh, uh, rescue operation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to our translators, uh, Gisela and Karolina, uh, to my colleagues for technical support, to Marek Kowalczyk and uh, Patryk Szostak. 
Uh, tomorrow we will hold our last meeting this year uh, devoted to reading our stories uh, from archival photographs taken from planes. Our guest is uh, um, an outstanding uh, expert, expert, Zygmunt Walkowski. So I would like to invite you. Uh, finally, uh, I wish you all have health and strength for this very strange COVID time. Uh, and happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and uh, Happy New Year. Uh, may there be no epidemic, and we will meet uh, not online, but in Berlin, for example. Uh, and we will continue these discussions uh, thanks to next research steps. Uh, once more, thanks for your attention. Uh, goodbye. Good night. Happy Bye. holidays. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.